So welcome to our webinar today for reducing plastic in your life. I am Nora Woodworth and I'm the program specialist at Happy Dancing Turtle. That is a nonprofit. You may or may not be familiar with us. If you are not, we are a nonprofit organization based in the Pine River, Minnesota area with a hub in the Driftless region of Minnesota and Wisconsin. And we are dedicated to growing good stewards of the planet by providing educational experiences for youth and adults that inspire wonder and empower change. So the program for you today is all part of that mission. I want to start out by telling you this is a super ambitious topic to cover in an hour. Um, so I'm going to do the best that I can to move through and hit on all the things that I think are really important on this topic. Um, I'm not an expert on this topic. It's merely something that I and my organization are passionate about, and we want to share what we know with you. I'm hoping we have time at the end for questions and discussion, um, and I'll follow up too with an email later this week um, with a long, long list of resources and different sources and things for you to look at if you want to verify some information or dig deeper on your own, or there'll also be some call to action things for you as well. So. Also, since this is a webinar, I know you can't talk. I really hope you can hear me. Um, somehow throughout the pandemic, I got through it without giving a Zoom webinar. So that would be terrible if you can't hear me for some reason. Um, but I will ask you some poll questions and then I encourage you to write down um, any questions that you might have for me so you don't forget before the end and you can put those into the question and answer chat feature on Zoom um, and hopefully we'll have time to address some of those. So. All right, um, here's what's on our agenda. Again, ambitious. We're gonna go through a very, very brief history of plastics. Um, why plastics are a problem on multiple fronts, right? Environmental, health, and social justice all come to mind when we talk about the problem of plastic pollution. We are gonna talk solutions. Some of those are more individual actions that you can take but individual actions are not going to get us where we need to be on the problem of plastic. So we'll be talking big scale community policy actions as well. And then, like I said, hopefully some time for discussion or questions. All right, so really, really quick, how did we get here? Where did plastics come from, right? The first plastics were made in the 1800s um, from plant cellulose. And there were a lot of issues with these plastics. One of them being when we tried to mold them into different shapes, they tended to burst into flames. So that's not so good. Um, and it wasn't until 1907 that Leo Bakeland created the first plastic from a non-renewable resource. So he made his out of coal and it was able to be formed and molded with heat and pressure into literally any shape that we could think of. Not long after that, the petrochemical industry really took off creating thousands of new chemicals so we just started adding those to the plastics that we had to see what would happen. It turns out it makes plastics do a bunch of different things, um, which means that then we can make a lot of different kinds of plastics with a lot of different uses. Uh, World War II happened shortly after that and we started seeing a resource shortage. So what filled that gap? Plastics. So the World War II was really, really, really when the plastics industry took off. Um, and you can see in the less than a 20 year period, the growth that we went from 25 million pounds in our plastic production to 650 million pounds in less than 20 years. That is an astronomical increase. Um, plastics was credited during the war for helping win the war. And then after that, it was this big peacetime celebration because suddenly we had all these new, new materials this new status of material wealth that had never been achieved before for super duper cheap. So it was more accessible to everybody. And there was just kind of this big joyous boom around plastic after the war. We entered into this disposable culture of affluence and we really haven't been away, been able to get away from it since. So what's the problem with where we're at with that? Well, if we look at where we're going with our plastic production, it is up, 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 up. In the last 20 years, we've created 56% of the plastic that has ever been created since we started making plastic. So our rise is pretty drastic. Along with that, um, there's a lot of greenhouse gases and pollution that are emitted at every stage of that plastic production. So right now, if we look at the Paris Climate Accord, right? We've set this goal to reduce our carbon emissions. 
if we're going to hit that goal, we have to reduce them by half by 2030, which if you look at the plastic industry's goal, um, that doesn't quite add up, right? They're on track to more than double their carbon emissions by 2030. So if we have these overarching goals for where we're going with climate change, we really have to spend some time thinking about how plastic fits into that situation. The plastic, oil, and petrochemical industry have no intention of slowing down. So if there's going to be change, it's gonna be driven by consumers and individuals and activists. Okay. The other part of the problem, right? We've been kind of lied to, if you will, um, throughout time that if we're using plastic, that's fine. All we have to do is recycle it. That is very far from the truth. But a new study has recently come out from a group called Beyond Plastics. And they estimate that in the US, our current recycling rate has dropped oops, to just between five to 6%, which is pretty appalling. Um, so compared to other materials, we recycle plastics a lot less. And there's also another problem with plastics, which is that they cannot be recycled forever. So even if we could get up to this very ambitious goal of 50% recycled, doesn't really matter because every time we recycle plastic, um, it becomes a little bit lesser in quality. It's called downgrading. And eventually that plastic is still going to end up either in a landfill or it gets incinerated if it's not recycled. So recycling cannot be the only solution to our problem of plastic we have to reduce our reliance on it. We have to stop creating so much because we don't have a good place to put it when we're done with it. Okay. I'm gonna skim over this pretty quick because I feel like we're hearing a lot about this in social um, media right now, but the problem of plastic pollution is huge, 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 huge. You've probably heard the statistic that we're dumping a garbage truck full of plastic into the ocean every single minute, right? That's bad news bears. Um, lots of studies being done currently on wildlife, whether they're getting entangled in the plastic, eating the plastic, it's causing a bunch of harm. The one that I do like to point out is the seabirds because we've been tracking plastic ingestion in seabirds for actually quite a long time. Scientists, ornithologists love birds, man. Um, so in the 1960s, less than 5% of seabirds had plastic in their stomachs when they were analyzed. In 1980, 80% had plastic in their stomachs. The last report I could find was from 2015, and that number was over 90%. Um, and they estimate by 2050, it will be 100% of, of seabirds with plastic in their stomach. That's a problem because between 1950 and 2010, we also saw that we had a 67% decline in seabird populations. And this is one of the species that we've studied, well, multiple species, that we've studied the most. So what's going on in those other species that we haven't spent a lot of time looking at yet? Okay. The other part of the problem with our plastic pollution is that it doesn't stay as big pieces of plastic, right? If it was all still out there in bottles, it would be much easier to clean up. But plastics do something that we call photo degradation. So when the sunlight hits it, it starts breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces and it never truly disappears. It might become microscopic, so we can't see it anymore, but it's not gone. And that's a problem in and of itself, right? So we have found microplastics in our, in our oceans, in our fresh water, in our groundwater. It's definitely in your tap water, that's not good. It's in the air that we're breathing in. It's in our soil. We don't have any idea what that's doing to things that we're growing in that soil yet. So we're finding all these new, all these microplastic talk is pretty recent. Um, it's really, really, gotten to be a bigger topic in the last 10 years. And there's still so much that we don't know. Plastics in and of themselves, which we'll talk about more about this in a second, but tend to leach toxic chemicals into the environment. And they can also accumulate toxic chemicals from the environment. So if they're hanging out in some infested waters where maybe there's some persistent organic pollutants of some sort, PFAS, um, they can collect those and then carry them off to new places. So again, lots of things we don't know about it, but none of it sounds very good. Plastics can also bioaccumulate or the toxins from them can also bioaccumulate in the food chain. Um, so we found plastics even in the tiniest ocean creatures in our zooplankton. So 
bigger fish come along and eat that zooplankton and suddenly they've eaten that plastic and any toxics, toxins that go with it. And some of those toxins accumulate in muscle or fat. So as you move up the food chain and more and more things are eating them, it gets to be in higher concentrations and that can be dangerous for our apex predators, which include humans. Speaking of the things we eat, right? We're not just eating plastics um, in other animals, which we totally are, science has found out, but it's also in our water, it's in our beer, it's in our bottled beverages, it is everywhere. So there's no longer a debate about if we're eating plastics. We know we're eating plastics. Uh, what we're not sure about is how much we're really eating and how much we can eat before we should start to be really, really concerned about it. My personal preference is none, but that's easier said than done. Um, I also wanted to point out here that so there's lots of infographics going around, especially related to this. Maybe it's just because I've been doing plastic stuff, but my Facebook feed keeps telling me I eat <laughs> the same amount of plastic a week that's in one credit card. And I was like, wow, that sounds like a lot of plastic. So I did a little digging. And it turns out that study actually says that on average, scientists are estimating between 0.1 gram and five grams of plastic, which if you look at the infographic they made from that, based on which number you're going to use, that's a really different calculation, right? So if it's five grams, it says we eat 250 grams of plastic in one year. If it's 0.1 grams, that would mean we ate about 374 grams in our whole lifetime. So don't always believe what you see. Sometimes you got to dig a little deeper. Okay. There's a big pool of evidence around plastics in human health, right? Um, all those toxic chemicals that we add into our plastics, we used to think there was just over 100,000 of them. Recently, scientists combined databases from all across the world and found that there were over 350,000 chemicals that can be purchased on the market to be added to your product. I'm not sure how the EPA or the FDA is supposed to regulate those chemicals if they don't even know they exist, right? A lot of our products are made in other parts of the world and then imported to the US. So the whole process is very convoluted very complex and very not well done at all. So my point is we can't really rely on them to make sure that these toxic things aren't ending up in our plastics, in our food packaging, right? Where they're really gonna come, cause harm to our bodies. The other part of this is when the EPA um, made the Toxic Chemical Control Act of 1976, then just grandfathered in 62,000 chemicals that were already in use, because why not? We were using them. Um, so we kind of have this innocent until proven guilty attitude with our chemicals. And that people say that has kind of made us the human experiment, right? We are the guinea pigs testing out whether these chemicals are safe, which is really dangerous. Um, I personally really enjoyed this movie. Others really, there's, there's criticism on both sides, but if, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the concept, it's definitely worth a watch for some eye-opening statistics, and then you're welcome to do your own some more research into those topics, but uh, definitely put it on your list. The other problem with this is that uh, it's really hard to do this research, right? We're not taking humans and pumping them full of these toxic chemicals to see what will happen. So it's hard to have very good scientific data with human, um, with a human population as your sample, and that has controls because we have a lot of environmental factors going on. So it's hard to narrow down exactly what is causing what to happen. We can't really put humans in the lab to try that out. We do have quite a bit of evidence from animal studies, um, but again, there is some kind of hesitation about, well, how does that translate to humans? Either way, we know we're eating plastics, we know plastics are in our body, and we know that in a lot of other animals, they have detrimental effects. So it's, it's reason for concern. So if you see a plastic with that little number one in it, right? That's our polyethylene terephthalates. I don't know who decided to have so many silent pHs in plastics, but that's a thing. So it might see, say PET or PETE1. Those are in a lot of products and they're considered relatively stable. Here's the thing with plastics. 
any type of plastic, if you put it into sunlight, if you expose it to heat, if it gets scratched, if it goes through like super cold, super hot, um, I should say freezing cold and super hot cycles, all of those tend to make plastics degrade faster. So while number ones might be relatively stable, if you have a water bottle full of water that's been in your car for three years in your emergency stash, it is now filled with toxic chemicals from that plastic. So the longer it's exposed to liquids over time, that heat, the sun, all of those things are gonna make it leach things in your car. Overall though, considered a relatively stable, kind of medium safe plastic. Then we have polyethylene. So we have low density polyethylene, which is LDPE. Think of that as, you know, your, your stretchy, flexible plastics that are lots of bags at the grocery store or our shopping bags in general. So that's number four. And then there's a second kind, high density polyethylene, um, number two, which is semi-rigid. It might also make bags like cereal liners or other sorts of um, containers like milk jugs. Both of these are typically considered to be relatively safe, stable plastics that don't have a lot of leaching going on. Then you have your polyvinyl chloride, your PVC. This is a plastic to avoid at all cost. Um, over 50% of it by weight tends to be those chemical additives that we know are really bad for our health. And we'll talk about some of those in just a second. Um, and these are in some really scary places. Kids toys is a big one. Uh, kids are ingesting some of those toxins when they're sucking on those toys. So be especially careful for toddler toys because they tend to go in the mouth. Takeout containers, you know, where we put our food medical tubing, you have the right to ask your doctor about if there's PVC in your medical tubing before they run your blood through it or give you IVs through it or whatever that might be. And squeeze bottles like in our fridge for ketchup and all those things. It can also be hard, which tends to be in our pipes, um, fencing, decking, some furniture. So we might not get as, as much direct exposure to those things, but they're long lasting in our houses, right? Go through the last couple, um, we already did number four. Polypropylene, number five, again, considered to be a relatively stable plastic. It's starting, I feel like I'm starting to see a lot more of it and my recycling company just started recycling it. So perhaps we're moving more in that direction. Polystyrene, number six, no good, right? It can come in a hard form. Um, it can also come in an expanded form where they pump it full of air and that's known as styrofoam. And this is known to leak many, many carcinogens. So when you get your takeout, right? In your styrofoam container, that's not good. Um, avoid number six. Polycarbonate is number seven, and that's kind of a trick because seven is actually just a catch-all for all the other plastics that don't fit into those first six. But it's very hard, strong, transparent plastic. So if you're thinking about plastic reusable water bottles, it's probably a polycarbonate, um, and it can be filled again with some of those additives that we'll talk about in a second. So here's your general guide. I would argue with this general guide, right? I would argue that category seven is red uh, because we don't know what seven is. It could be lots of different things. So therefore we don't know the health effects from it. But two, four, and five, if you're going to use plastics are your safest choices. So what's the problem with some of those additives? Again, I'll try to move the, this really quick and then we're moving on after one more thing to solutions. Um, BPA, we've all heard about BPA probably at this point. Phthalates are another one and PFAS. And I'll go into these in more detail in a second, but right out of the gate, all of these are not required to be listed on any of the products for the most part, I should say. They have been found by the CDC in multiple studies to be in over 90% of the humans sampled. And those studies are over 20 years old now. So I can't say it with certainty, but I would guess that those numbers are even higher at this point. So again, we know these chemicals are inside of our bodies at this point. We just don't know at what level it's safe and when we have to really start to be concerned. Um, they're also all endocrine disruptors, which 
can cause a lot of different things going on. Um, endocrine disruptors disrupt our normal hormones from functioning properly and can cause all sorts of different things ranging from reduced fertility rates, uh, cancer, respiratory disease, impairments to growth and development. Um, if some have been linked to diabetes and obesity, there's like no end in sight for what we're linking these things to. So BPA, maybe you remember, has actually been banned from just two products though, sippy cups and baby bottles in 2012. And this was not because the FDA did their jobs and was like, hey, this is actually dangerous and causing problems. It's because of this angry group of moms that really went after the FDA and said, you have to ban this. We can't have this going into our infants. Um, finally, the FDA listened, but only banned it from those two products, even though it's in a lot of other things like linings for food cans. Um, but the problem is that even when we get something banned, and hopefully that would be banned on a wider scale, but we get this whack-a-mole issue. So we said, okay, we can't use bisphenol A, but then we use bisphenol F and S and Z. And there are so many chemicals out there and we have to prove each one guilty until we can pull it off the market. So it makes this whack-a-mole issue where the issue really is still there, right? There's still dangerous things in our products. So we really need a rehaul on how we're regulating these things. Phthalates are plasticizers, they add flexibility and they make scent last longer in products. So these, again, are often found in children's toys and we're working to ban more of them right now, but they're also found in like every personal care product ever. And the really astounding thing here is that they can be listed as fragrance on these products and that's considered a trade secret by the FDA. So you don't have to tell us what's in your fragrance, even though there's 4,000 different chemicals that companies use to make those fragrances. Kind of messed up. PFAS is another one um, that we hear about a lot lately as it relates to our water. This is known as a forever chemical. It breaks down super slow. It stays in our environment for a really long time. It can accumulate inside of our bodies. Um, and we didn't think that we were actually using it in plastics that much until well, in some types of our plastic pack packaging, I should say, um, until recently. So there's currently a big ban, attempt to get this banned. But if you've ever seen the movie Dark Waters, PFAS was the chemical component that was an issue with Teflon. And that litigation started 40 years ago and we just got those two types of PFAS banned in 2014. So it took 40 years to make that change. We've got to do better and we've got to go quicker. All right, last problem with our plastics. And this one I feel like doesn't get talked about enough, but plastics are a huge social justice issue. Um, the US makes is the third producer for plastics worldwide. A lot of our plastics are produced in Louisiana and there's this stretch of 85 miles along the Mississippi in Louisiana and it is called the Cancer Corridor, okay? Science has proven it that cancer rates here are higher than in other rates in the country. And a new study has also proven that that is directly related to um, low income communities and people of color. So communities with high amounts of people of color and low incomes are much more likely to have terrible air quality and higher rates of cancer. And this isn't just happening in that cancer corridor, but that's where a lot of the research is going on um, in effect to that. Once all those products are made, it's still not affecting everybody equally. So it's our low income communities that are the most likely to buy the cheapest plastics with the most toxic chemicals in them. And then there's also a bunch of new research in showing that um, personal care pr products targeted towards the black community have much higher toxicity rates than the general um, reservoir, if you will, of personal care products. And there's a really great documentary that touches on this a bunch, um, a new HBO series called Not So Pretty, if you wanna learn more about that. But all these things, all these new aspects are kind of just starting to come to the surface or maybe, or, or I should say maybe just getting more light than they used to. Recycling is also a definite social justice problem. We export a bunch of our recycling. And even though we've tried kind of half-heartedly to manage this in the past, 
the U.S. still exports a lot of plastic, whether it's e-waste or just general plastic, to other countries in the world. Um, most of these countries don't have adequate waste management systems, so a lot of it ends up in the environment. It also is terrible working conditions that are very dangerous for humans, and a lot of those humans are children, so they're employing child labor at a lot of these recycling facilities. We're pretty quick too, perhaps you've heard this, that just, uh, just 10 rivers in the world empty 93% of our ocean trash into the ocean. So we're pretty quick to put the blame on communities surrounding these 10 rivers. Uh, but if you look at it, we cumulatively over the years, China has ended up with 42% of our plastic waste, right? So of course their rivers are gonna be the most polluted with plastic and dumping that plastic back into the ocean. But we're quick to point our fingers and say, hey, you've got to clean up your rivers. Look at what all that pollution that you're doing, even though it's coming from nations across the world. Um, these are some pictures that I've taken on my travels to different places. So it's not always due to us exporting our waste. A lot of countries just don't have facilities where they can recycle. Um, and I was in Papua New Guinea and Coca-Cola was cheaper than water there, but there was not a recycling facility on the entire island. When I asked where I could fill my water bottle, they laughed and told me it was a two hour hike. And I said, okay, let's go. And I hiked all the way up there with them to see how far the locals would go to get water. And then they laughed at me again at the top. And they're like, locals don't come here. You have a white person's stomach. Like you can't handle the water that we got right from the creek near our house. Um, but the fact that we keep exporting not only our waste, but all these products that come in single use plastic containers to countries that literally have nowhere to put that waste is pretty astounding to me. All right, I hope you're feeling pretty low and I'm sorry if you're feeling pretty low, but I think it's important that we have these conversations about those negative aspects, right? We need something to motivate us to wanna to make change because it's pretty easy to sit back in our lives and be like, yeah, I think I'm doing pretty well, right? So what can we do? Historically, we've talked about the three R's. Three R's aren't enough. I've put eight R's up here and I ranked them how I think they're important. Um, but they follow that overall hierarchy where we want recycling at the bottom. It's not our frontline solution to plastic. We really need to reduce our consumption. So we'll go through these. Rethink. We need to rethink what we're doing as consumers. We need conscious consumerism where we're worried about the purchases that we're making and we're not just buying everything in sight. So really give it some thought before you make a purchase. Do I need this, right? How long will it last? Could I pay a little more for something that's gonna last longer? Is there one made from a different material? Is there a version of this with less packaging or less toxic materials? Is there a version of this with a lifetime warranty, right? Gifting is another area where we really need to give some things some thought. I think we need to normalize secondhand gifts, gifting experiences, homemade gifts. How about trading skills with somebody, right? We see a lot of waste come from our, our gifting norms. We really need that change in mindset. And there is starting to be some evidence that maybe this is happening. And I find this to be very uplifting because it's pretty easy for me to get down in like this deep, dark plastic hole where we're not doing anything to change. Um, but all of this is, is slow. It's not gonna happen overnight. You need to be mindful about it. And it's not all or nothing, right? I look around my house and I see a lot of things still and I'm well into my plastics journey that I could be doing better. But then I look at all the things I have changed and I hope that they're making an impact. Um, we're starting to see in a huge survey that went out that people are paying more for sustainable products. Um, there's been 30% growth in the sustainable products market in the last, that well, from 2013 to 2018. So that was only over five years. People are willing to pay more for products that they know are better for the planet. Um, and interestingly enough, people who were told about those products from somebody else were more likely to buy them. 
So sharing your thoughts, discussing what you found that works, helping to educate others is a super duper important part of this process. Um, it can also be a lot cheaper, right? Because some of these changes aren't always that cheap. So if I can find somebody who has already done the legwork and tested different products and found what they like, talk about those things, right? It's gonna make a difference. Um, everybody's journey is gonna look different. So there's no getting around that making some of these changes will be an additional cost. The idea being that hopefully these products are gonna last longer and maybe that cost evens out over the end. But there's other ways to make an impact if, if switching your purchasing habits are not in your realm of capabilities. Okay. The second R after we think is rise up. We gotta use our voices, we gotta take action. Um, there's debate in the plastics world about if individual action can be enough or if we're, I don't even wanna say it, but if we're all just kind of wasting our time because on the time scale that we have left, we need systemic big corporation change, policy change in order to make an impact in that very scary time frame, right? So there's lots of different things you can do. So far, almost all the progress has been consumer driven. So again, use your voice, contact your representatives, whether they're local, state, county, whatever they might be, get in touch with them. Um, and we'll talk more about what you might be getting in touch with them in a second. They use social media. There's this dare to care campaign. If you're big with hashtags or if you're big on calling people out on social media, this is a way you get a call out like big corporations or brands that you maybe used to love. And then you found out they did something really that you don't love. Call them out, dare to care. Uh, gather other locals to sign a petition, maybe to send to a local businesses. Maybe your favorite restaurant is still using a lot of plastic in there to go or takeout containers. And you can get 200 people together and be like, hey, we'd really like it if you would change this. Look for local events, rallies, cleanup events, educational opportunities in your communities to make change. Join a larger campaign through a nonprofit organization. There are lots of big nonprofits out there doing this work. And whether you can support them with your time, your skills, your money, whatever it might be, they would gladly accept it. And vote, 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 vote. Um, consider this. Venn diagram, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson is big time news in the plastics pollution fight right now. If you don't follow her on social media, I recommend it. Um, and she came up with this kind of this Venn diagram of three things to think about to help you decide what your climate action should be and where you can make the most change. Okay. Systemic policy change is kind of focused on two different areas. One is policies for consumers, and that includes things like banning certain materials. And we hear about like plastic bag bans or straw bans a lot these days. Um, it can also take the form of taxing something. So sure, you can use that plastic bag, except you're gonna pay more at checkout because you're using that bag. There's also refunds, which have been really successful in Europe when people bring certain containers back to the store, they get a certain amount of money back. And then we also just have to look at changes to our, uh, our waste management infrastructures, which here in the US are a lot better than a lot of other parts in the world. So how do we get those built in other parts of the world where we're seeing a lot of plastic pollution? Then we also can put pressure on our, or I'm sorry, on our producers. So we have this push that we need to go to a more circular economy. Um, where the products that you're making need to have an end life thought out when we make them, right? What can we recycle them into? What are they going to be used for after we're done with them? And what's the end goal for that product? It also includes thinking about where our materials are coming for, from, making um, sure they're sustainable, making sure they're safe for humans to use, but putting this pressure back on the producers, right? Right now, the consumers are the ones dealing with this problem. How is it fair that these corporations are making billions of dollars and they don't have any accountability in the solution to the problem that they largely created? So there's a big push for this right now in policy. Um, the, the other hurdle that we face here, right, is that some places, and this boggles my mind a little, have come out, like all those states highlighted in orange on that very weird looking map, have come out with preemptive legislation to prevent bans. So every one of those orange states, Minnesota included, 
um, has a ban against something. In Minnesota, ours is a bag ban. We've banned the bag ban. So, so different cities and towns are not allowed to ban plastic bags in our state. And this makes it extra hard to make process because progress, because now instead of just saying, okay, our community has decided to ban straws, first we have to change the legislature of our state to allow us to say that, which is pretty crazy that we're here. But here are some of the things that we are doing that are going super well. Oh man, my time is really getting a crunch. Um, I'm gonna skip over these, but these are all different policies that are currently either being talked about, being passed, things that give us hope for the future. And I'm happy to answer any questions about those later. Great. I'm gonna skip this poll as well. So our next step is refuse, right? Refuse those single use plastics. And we can move through this, I think pretty quickly because we've been hearing about it a lot. So these are the 10 items that we pick up most commonly from our oceans and they're all single use things, right? Cigarette butts, which the filters in there are plastic, maybe you didn't know that. Food wrappers, straws, stirs, forks, knives, and spoons, disposable cutlery, um, bottles, bottle caps, grocery bags, other plastic bags, plastic lids, plastic cups and plates. Do whatever you can to get these items out of your life. Use the reusables. There's some that we might not hear about as often. Coffee pods. If you have a Keurig, I do, uh, those coffee pods are bad news bears. Reusable coffee pods work great. Flossers and Q-tips often have plastic in them. One and done. Dryer sheets, feminine care products. The average woman will use about 17,000 tampons in her life, right? That's, that's a lot. So there are other options there. Gum is filled with plastic, trash bags, disposable cleaning items, makeup and baby wives, wipes, baby wives. Baby wipes are huge ones as well that create a lot of waste. So cutting out any of these things um, can make a big difference. Reducing plastic in your home. I originally had six more slides about this. Um, so I pulled out some common themes to save on time. But again, if you have other more detailed questions about any of this, I would love, obviously I love talking about this and I would talk to you about it all day later. So first thing that you gotta look at is your packaging, right? And packaging means more than just like what it's getting shipped to you in. Maybe my ketchup is coming in a squeeze bottle. Could my spaghetti sauce come in a glass bottle instead of plastic? Look at your packaging, what's included. Are there less toxic or non-toxic plastic packaging options? So can you get your eggs in a carton instead of in a clamshell? Can you get your shampoo in a bar instead of in a bottle? Is the pack packaging easily recyclable for me? Because that's gonna change from place to place, right? So if you're buying a bunch of things in container number fives and you can't recycle container number fives, that doesn't really help you out. Um, does it even need packaging? Can you find one that doesn't have any packaging at all? So I think this is the hardest in the kitchen and the bathroom. Uh, I would encourage you to do an inventory, which there's a book, uh, Susan Frankel's book, Plastic, A Toxic Love Story. She goes through this inventory process and I did it in my own home. And I was shocked and disgusted and there was so much more plastic hiding than I would have ever, ever thought and more single use items still than I would have thought I had. So do this inventory of your packaging. What do you use that's in bottles? What number are on those bottles? Is it even safe for you to be consuming food out of those bottles? Really take a good hard look at your packaging. Okay. Then look at what single use items do you still rely on and how can you swap them out for reusable items. And we hear about this all the time, right? Bring your own coffee buns, bring your own food containers, bring your own bags, bring your own produce bags, whatever that might be. There's a lot of information about this, so I won't dwell on it too long. But again, do that inventory in your house. And I bet you will find items that when you really think about them, you're like, wow, I do use that just one time. Okay. Look for plastic-free alternatives. Um, this is, this is a big, big topic with lots of different options, but in the kitchen, wood, bamboo, stainless steel, glass, ceramic, food grade, silicone, not a plastic, um, beeswax wraps, all of those are your friends and good options. 
if you only do one thing and get rid of plastics in one part of your house, I would urge it to be the kitchen and I would get rid of any old Teflon or any cheap plastic utensils like a spatula that come into contact with a heat source, okay? Or if you are putting plastic in your microwave, please stop doing that. I don't care if it says that it's microwave safe. It's not, okay? So no more plastic in your microwave. Um, so kitchen is a big priority area just because it comes into contact with so much food and we're ingesting those things. The other area is your bathroom because of all the personal care products, but we'll touch on that more in the next one. Bedding and clothing are another thing to look really carefully at because a lot of our fibers are now plastic. So look for or, um, cotton, hemp, linen, canvas, bamboo, uh, tensile or lyosol, silk, wool, all of those don't have plastic and are good alternatives. Also look at your ingredient list, right? And that's where we get into the scary realm for the, the cosmetics and personal care products because a lot of them contain plastic in them and then we rub them all over you know, our skin and absorb it through our skin and that can be really detrimental. That is not easy to do, right? When they don't have to list all of their ingredients, but hopefully that is changing. And there's also some apps I'll show you at the end um, that you can use the environmental working group and beat the micro bead. Both of those allow you to enter or scan a product and it will tell you if there's something scary in there, which is really helpful. Part of this is also gonna be from changing behaviors in our house. Um, we've talked about the microwaving. The other thing, in the kitchen especially, is washing plastic. Same with the microwave, it might say dishwasher safe. It's not dishwasher safe. Uh, that heat and then the, the detergents over long periods of time can make it leach different chemicals. So it's better to just hand wash it. The other thing in your kitchen is filtering your water. So now that we know there are these tiny, tiny bits of plastics all up in our water, we need a filter that can get those plastics out of our water. And depending on how careful you want to be, you can go with different systems. There's like beefed up Britica systems now that can um, take out even up to nanoparticles of plastic. But if you want to make sure that your water is 100% plastic free, reverse osmosis is the only water filtration system we have that will do that for you. So that's maybe a bigger investment in your future. Um, then you got to look at your e-waste, right? Do we need an Alexa in every single room? of our house? Probably not. E-waste really adds up. So take, that's another good inventory situation. Look at everything. What do you have? What do you actually need? What can you choose that might last a little longer than what you've been choosing? All right, we've got a few more hours to get through, but I think we can do it. These are all pretty self-explanatory R's, so we're going to move through them fast, but they're all really important. So reuse or repurpose. Again, we have got to normalize the second hand um, thrifting, hand-me-downs, all those things are really important. Everything we reuse or, or give a second life to is one thing that's not creating demand of new materials from the plastic industry. But you should also be cautious, right? As we move towards banning all sorts of different chemicals and things, which hopefully we are, um, that means that some of the older things that other people have maybe dropped at the thrift store might have some of those chemicals in them. So be careful what you're buying and what you're using them for you might find you're okay with some things more than other things. Donate or consign what you don't need because it could be somebody else's secondhand find. And then get creative with how you can upcycle things. Does it have to go to the landfill or is there some really creative way that you can use it to avoid that? Repair, can you get it fixed, right? We're pretty quick to discard items these days um, and purchase something new that never goes away. So take a class, learn how to mend, Become friends with your local tailor shop, electronics repair shop, small motor repair shops. You can find a bunch of information now on fix-it clinics if you have one in your local community or swapping events. Toy swaps are a big one, right? Kids outgrow toys really fast. So can we swap with a friend instead of buying new? Um, and then think about warranties when you're buying things. How long are they gonna ensure that this product lasts? And there's this fun website called Buy Me Once where everything on there has a lifetime guarantee. Compost. Uh, this could be a whole separate PowerPoint all by itself. So all I'm going to say is be very, very, very weary of the new compostable plastics, bio-based plastics, 
or um, ooh, biodegradable plastics, because just because they slap that on there does not mean that that's true. Most of the compostable plastics would have to be done so in a commercial facility that reached really high temperatures, and that's not going to happen in our backyard composting. So if you are part of a commercial composting route or facility, great, check with them to see if you can do that. If not, avoid them. Um, this actually makes these plastics harder to break down in a landfill setting, which is maybe good because then you can scoop them out, right? But it's kind of like we put natural on foods. It's just a label right now that's getting slapped on things and there's very little evidence behind whether it's true. So be wary. Can a new product be made from it? Um, I cannot stress enough that you really have to know your local recycling program. It is different on every level. And we tend to do this thing that we call wish cycling, right? So I don't know if this is recyclable or maybe I'm traveling and I don't know if it's recyclable here. So I'm just gonna put it in the bin and hope that it gets recycled. Um, this leads to contamination of our waste in that recycling process. And eventually nobody's gonna take the time to sort that out. They're just gonna send it all to the landfill. So when in doubt, throw it out. Um, your local recycling program can also change kind of rapidly. So make sure to stay up to date on that. Utilize local drop-off programs. So different stores have drop-off um, programs for different materials. Uh, we can talk, if you have questions about what some of those might be, I can answer those and I'll send out some in the resources. And then there's also mail-in programs like TerraCycle. And real quick, I'll just share that when I started this, I started doing it for plastic waste. It cost me $90 for one box where I shove all my plastic packaging in there, I can't recycle, and I ship it back. That box lasted me about two months, which really, really, really made me take a look at what I was buying, um, what I needed, what I didn't need, and what changes I could make. Because imagine how different our world would look if we were all paying $90 per box to get rid of our plastic waste. So this can be a really helpful tool to kind of analyze where you're at um, and really force you to make changes that otherwise you might be like, well, it's just one bag, it's okay. Not all recycling is created equal. So um, some are harder to recycle than others. Even if you can recycle them, they don't often get turned into new products. So just keep that in mind again. This is why recycling is at the bottom of our list. It's not our top solution, okay? These are all things that are gonna take a while. So start small, pick one thing to change at a time, right? Once that habit is in place, then move on to something else. Um, pay attention to those ingredients and the types of plastics. I can share a couple apps of that, again, that beat that microbead and then the environmental working group are great for checking. Use your voice, educate, share, vote, rise up and vote with your dollar. This is where we're gonna see that consumer driven change and I can't emphasize that enough. So view companies as a whole that align with your values. Um, certified B, 1% for the planet, cradle to cradle and programs that are companies that offer lifetime guarantees are all, all good ways to do that. Okay. This quote really hit me about a couple months ago. I really dropped a lot of my plastics uh, solutions, I should say, during COVID. It says, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know, right? And that hit me the other day. So what are you going to do now that you know? Okay. I'm happy to take questions. Man, I really wish that you were all here and we could interact, but it's a webinar, so you can't talk to me. But if you want to throw a question in the chat, I would be more than happy to answer it. My email's also up there if you want to chat further about any of these topics. I know I had to skim over quite a few because an hour is just not enough time to save the world. Um, I do see one question, question on there about what was the book with the plastic inventory? author, Susan something. Um, I can do you one better here somewhere. It is called Plastic, A Toxic Love Story, written by Susan Frankel. It is a little bit older. It was written, I think about a little over 10 years ago, but still a super good read if you're interested in the topic of plastic. It's kind of about why plastic is a problem, but we have become so reliant on it, it's gonna be hard to change. So it's good. Mm -hmm. 
any other questions, if you can find your Q&A button at, down at the bottom, you can throw them in the chat and I should be able to see them. Yes, good question. Um, will I be following up with a list of resources? Absolutely, part of why I had to go so fast. Um, I will send out to the emails that you registered with a list of resources that, sorry, I see more questions coming in. I'm getting really distracted. I'll send out a list of resources where you can go to learn more about lots of the topics that I hit on. Um, it will also include some different nonprofits that have calls to action and things you can do to help. And then some consumer guide kind of things that help might help you find new products to look at um, or help you learn about why some products you might want to avoid. And also has books, movies, and documentaries on there as well. Are there any local communities that compost? Um, yes, definitely. I don't know where that question asker lives. So uh, Susan K, if you wanna throw a location in there, um, but right now there are different communities that compost. There is no rhyme or reason to where those might be. Lots of times bigger cities have commercial composting facilities. Um, some of them, even like Minneapolis, they'll pick up your compost at your door. A lot of rural communities do not currently have community compost where we can put food scraps. You might be able to compost yard scraps, um, but we, we're, rural communities just currently aren't set up very often for composting food scraps. That being said, HDT is very interested in looking into that. So hopefully in the future, there'll be more information about that. Can you share this so that we can share with family? Um, we did record this webinar, so it will be available. If you would like a link to it, I, I guess you can just email us and we'll find a way to get you a recording of that. I also got a request for a link to the PowerPoint. Um, yes, ooh, great presentation, thanks. Um, I will send out a link to the PowerPoint as well. And there's even more information in all the notes. So if you wanted to see that. I'm also not opposed if you wanna share this PowerPoint with somebody, the goal is just to get the information out there. I don't care who gets it out there. So feel free to use it as well. Um, I don't, oh, nope, there are more questions. Micro fleece and microfiber, that's another fabric to avoid, right? Ah, yes. So fleece is actually made out of, of plastic fibers, um, like my Patagonia fleece that I love. The big problem with the fleece comes in the wash cycles. So I try really hard to only wash my microfiber Patagonia fleece when it really needs it. Um, the laundering cycle releases a bunch of those tiny, tiny plastic pieces that we can't even see. And we're finding a lot of them in our waterways from our laundry. So yes, fleece is an issue. They are, I know Patagonia is doing some research to try to find that cleaner, um, uh, cleaner way to, to make it where it will be less likely to shed those fibers. I'm not sure where they are in the progress for that. But the biggest thing you can do if you have fleece clothing is just to try to wash it less, which might sound a little dirty, but honestly, we all wash our clothes way more than we need to. So cutting back on your laundry can actually help you reduce your plastic pollution. Just saying, good question. Oh, Susan Kay is from the Brainerd Lakes area. Um, I'm not sure about that, Susan. I work down in the Driftless area and I'm not very familiar with what will be offered up there. If you wanna shoot me an email, I can try to find out for you and get you some resources that might be helpful for your area. If not, backyard composting, whoop, whoop. Oh, they're still coming in. Ooh, look at this community support happening here. Um, Carol, I hope I can share this, Carol, because I'm sharing it. She says, I live in Hastings part of the year. They recently started an organics drop-off site since the city doesn't offer pickup like Minneapolis or larger cities. 
Um, I'd love to have an option up here also, Nisswa or in the Brainerd Lakes area. I think you're not alone. So keep voicing what you would like in those areas and eventually, right, hopefully organizations will move towards that change. We're hearing um, a lot of demand for that as well. And I don't wanna to share too much, but HDT is currently looking into options on how to assess what our community needs and what, what might that lead to in the future for different facilities. Can't fleece be washed in cotton bags to help? Great question. That's gonna need some research. Um, my guess would be no, just because the pieces that are coming off that fleece are microscopic. So is a cotton bag gonna prevent them from getting out and into the water and into the wash cycle? I don't know, but my guess would be no, but definitely something worth looking into. All solutions worth looking into. Carol says we should probably attend our local government meetings and encourage officials to start here. Yes, yes, absolutely. If you wanna see composting in your community, attend those meetings, rise up, make your voice heard. Or if you want different plastics recyclings or, or bans on whatever, those are all things that eventually somebody is gonna to need to bring to that community. And that person could be you. Bring a friend too, or 20, even better. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in and it is one o'clock, which I don't even know how it's not five o'clock, um, but thank you all for coming and listening to me just enthusiastically ramble about you about all the things we need to do. Um, I hope that something in this presentation makes you wanna make even just one small change or lots of small changes or one super big change and then tell all your friends to make them do it too. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be in touch with those resources and other, other things that you can look into uh, at home. Thanks so much, everybody.